is many's a gay night from dark till daylight I spend with people of high renown. But in all their grandeur and hopes to squander, my heart would wander for sweet Omad. Hello, calling Mr. Ford. Hello. Are you hearing us, Mr. Ford, today? I am indeed. I am indeed. In the wilds of Mountfield, I, I, can, I can hear you clearly. Well, we're still shipwrecked here in County Arvely, if you've ever heard it. <laughs> Uh, oh, there'll be a rescue boat along soon. There will be. You know, there'll be a ship. A ship will come to our rescue. <laughs> this is indeed the desert island ducks. <laughs> <laughs> I was. I'm not sure if I told you before. Someone sent me a lovely cartoon the other day of a, a a guy stranded on an island, but he was hiding behind the tree because this big cruise liner was coming up, and he didn't want to get be seen. <laughs> He's going to stick it out. <laughs> so I know how he feels. Well, I'm tell you, you know what? I think after this, there'll not be that many people going on cruise liners. I tell you what, we're in for changes. Whatever they are, you know, there'll be there'll be changes. All right now. Oh uh, yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. And, uh, I think uh, this will radically change the way that we work, and, and hopefully it'll radically, radically change our attitudes to life. Yeah. Speaking of work, Declan, I'm thinking of putting up an interview we done many many years ago with uh, Tony Mathers. Oh yes, um, S. D. Montgomery. He's right, and his uh, his father would have worked in the con for those who remember him uh, in the early days, and then the the work for uh, Montgomery's, and then they the, had a sort of workers buyout, I think maybe, and uh, three or four of them bought bought the business over, and then with the passing of time and technology changes, the whole thing has has moved on. I and I think the original building is now up in Coltra in the Folk Park. Hmm. And I think you're right. In my head makes me think, was it originally a, a, a church? It was probably, probably the site of the first Presbyterian church in Oma. That's yeah. the, that was the original you know, church, yes. Yeah, so yeah, so you know, looking mm-hmm. at it recently, I looked at an old photograph of it, you know, it had those kind of the church-like windows. Uh-huh. But it's there now, it's preserved. Yes. And uh, do you remember, uh, Johnny Mullen had a collection of posters that, that, uh, that, that uh, Tony had produced, and I think Dusty Springfield featured on them. Taste was another one. You're right, you're right. That's and, that's, uh, uh, that's 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 uh, his son, his father-in-law. Yeah, that'd be that's right. right. Yeah. Ah, yeah, that's right. And I think uh, that's Bar- yeah, was it, uh, Boneyard Records, isn't it? That's the Boneyard shop. Boneyard Records. Yes, that, yeah. that, uh, the, the Johnny and Mark McCausland are, uh, are uh, reviving the art of vinyl or great. vinyl, as they say out here in Midfield. No way, wouldn't they? Oh, great, it's great, great, great shop, and some great. It's like almost like the. Uh, you know the the one that the John Prine one that the tiny tiny rooms is it? We did great concerts from there in, in America. Uh, yes, yes. I, I I think Johnny and the boys are starting to get into that side. That's very good because they invite people in to sing a few songs on a Saturday and things, and it sure. brings I, I life to see, back to the time. Um, John Prine's guitar player, Jason Wilbur, did a, a set in it uh, the, the the weekend that John Prine came to Oma to mm. the Street Arts Centre. Mm-hmm. And he was excellent. And uh, well, we, we all hope that John Prine will pull through. Oh, well, he's certainly he's in our thoughts and prayers at the moment. But well, well, we, we can't afford to lose such a genius of a songwriter. No, no. You know, so uh, well. We can't afford Here's to lose anybody at all. Things mm. will improve, you know? Yes, I think in, in the fullness of time now, right? And I think that from memory, Tony said that the business was bought from the Montgomerys by Mr. Donaghy, who would have been the Owned the local cinema. Now, oh, do you yes. do you remember we spoke to his wife? Uh, yes, Mrs. Dunny, yes, I did. I oh, did, I, I do indeed. Yeah. I remember that well, and um, yeah. I think it was also uh, the Jemison family were part owners, were they not? Could well have been. I don't know, but I remember speaking to Mrs. Donahue about about that he he owned the, the cinema and the Star Ballroom as well. Um, and I, and, uh, I remember him. I, I remember him many many years ago. Yeah. We, yeah, we never knew him, obviously, but she talked about uh, her, f- she came from Belfast, I think she was a minister's daughter from Belfast, and I must see if that interview's still there. And that, we'll, would be, that would be fascinating, uh, that would be fascinating indeed. Uh, oh we, my goodness. And we have a Miss Cramond as well, remember her? Oh yes. If, any, if anyone remembers her, yeah. remembers the day the First World War ended. Yes. And uh, she was a sharp woman. Yes. Mm. Uh, we contacted her about doing the interview, and 
normally would have to go and would sort of tease out answers. Mm. But Miss Cameron, to be in the true teacher that she was, would have none of it. She had everything written out. <laughs> the old school. There were no I... questions asked at all. Uh, yes, she, yes. she just read it as she was brilliant. She's the, a lovely woman. Uh, the, the thing I remember then, if you haven't heard it now, and it could be 25 years, is uh, she said that they, when they came, I think they came from Donegal to Oma. That's right. Uh, she says that the nearest school that the nearest church was going to do, uh, and that's pretty much what they settled, and that was it. Uh, that started a new life in Oma. Funny, in that side of town, there's uh, an interview we done with uh, Captain Darning mm-hmm. at Crevna House, uh, and his life, and how he came to be there in another state and uh, we have that well, as well. He had a remarkable life and he's a lovely, lovely man. Mm. A great, very, uh, great, very, good very, character. Very civil to us, you know, and, and uh, they had a great, great uh, evenings uh, entertainment with him. Very generous with his very time and with us, you know, because I mean, two guys of us landed at his door with, with a tape recorder and he made us very welcome and, and was quite yeah. open and, and talked about about his life generally, yeah, from from the war. I think he was in the, in the Navy, obviously they were a Navy family as well as a military family. And I think he had been a Spitfire pilot during the war. A rear gunner, I think, from memory, yeah. A rear was, gunner. Yeah. Okay. Very, very nice man. Mm. Real gentleman, you know. So there's plenty and, to come and ahead, And yeah. as is Tony Mothers, and I remember yeah. Tony's, uh, the interview that we did with him, did everybody talk about the war years? Yes, he did. He talked and about his father. Yes, the posters during the war, and, that, ah, and the yes. way he talked about the the guild, or the guilds, and the and the printing. Yes, the, the protectionism for the jobs, and the, and the, uh-huh. yes, right, the unions. Yes, yes. That was a lovely interview. Ah, well, I we'll, look forward to hearing it. We will. We'll play that shortly for you. Um, and then there are so many people, other trades in the town, we've, we've spoken to as well. And uh, a name that comes to mind is that it Billy Davidson talking about the garages in the town where he worked in Quigley's, and then. Uh, in later years in, in Aiken's garage and uh, great great character and a great, a great, a great talker as well so yeah. uh, <laughs> I say my, my sitting room floor is like it's just uh, it's a big room and it's completely covered with these tapes and every day I never wrote name dates or anything down so right. I know that would have been early early 90s we would have done most oh. of these Declan, right? so it's a treasure trove you know and Aladdin's cave ah, it's it is as it is, and you know it's it's it's. Uh, and I think the people who do or will appreciate really are, are not even born yet. You know the people who will see their great great grandparents and, and hear them and you know and hear what their life was like. It'll be a social history for them, and uh, it's, and it's good for the town generally. I think if people can get something from it, but it's uh, you know it's and I suppose it must be sad for a lot of people because it evokes a lot of memories of people who have who have moved on. You know, you know. So. But you know, it's good to remember and celebrate the past. It is. It is. And we live in the present, and we look forward in the future. And that's as was the only solace that there is out of this these dark times that we're living in. But we, we'll, Oma people, are as you said the other night, are very resilient. Well, we have we have been, you know, when yeah. when you consider what we've been through over the years, um, and, yeah. and you know we have moved with it and, and lived with it and dealt with it as best we can. That it doesn't. Just never go away or never really dims but I think like anything once you could learn to use these things and people will learn to get used to life and, and when you hear someone like the wee Paddy McChrystal the late Paddy McChrystal talking about about his time and, 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 and as a prisoner of war and coming back and never even mention it to his family or colleagues at work or anything like that or never right. never been celebrated for what he did because events and, and life generally and he didn't see it as anything out of the ordinary really typical of, of, of good people in this town that, that have, have lived good lives and, um, so I, we will push on Mr Ford as best we can here in the uh-huh. solitary confinement one, pumped, one foot in front of the other mm. and let's hear Tony Mathers have a very good evening we'll talk to you soon bye bye all the best In a fit of pique, Winston Churchill once referred to the dreary steeples of Fermanagh and Tyrone. Indeed, to many, Oma may appear to be an insignificant grey little place. Situated 60 miles west of Belfast, gnawing at the toes of the Spirans, this ordinary town with its imposing courthouse, its derelict jail and its redundant railway has seen through the ages the best of times 
and the worst of times. These programmes will take you on a tour of a hidden town. Beneath the very ordinariness of these stories lie some very extraordinary people. People who make up the heart of the hidden Oma. Our story begins at the end of an era. In this age of multimedia computer technology, we have silently witnessed the lingering death of a style of printing and craftsmanship dating back some 700 years. He vividly remembers his earliest visits to the printing press of the Tyrone Constitution. God, I loved as a boy, going down the town with my mother, only a week ago, but maybe six or seven, I can remember it yet. Going down the town with my mother, and I'd be coming up past the Tyrone Constitution where my father worked. And she put her hand up, and she said, Oh God, she says, Tony, I forgot the key. Will you run down to the, to the, to the, down to the print works down there she says, and get the key here, Daddy? Well, they get down to that place there, it was like some sort of a fairyland. You opened the door, and the first one was the heat, and the noise of the machinery, the lovely noise of the machinery. And the old Jack Teelady of the old manager was there, I think it was uh, Herbie Livingstone's father, as far as I remember. Big white apron, take you up the stairs and lead you down through these three or four layer type machines. And all the, the men at them, looking around, hello son, how you doing? Joe, Joe, here's the cob, you know, and you go down and you stand, and they stand on your head. Stand, literally stand on your head. And then he would get the key in here. And you wouldn't see him, you see, as you would see him at home. As you see him at home, uh, he'd be sitting in his pullover or his coat or his jacket or his maybe his cap when he'd come out from his work. You go down there, you see him sitting with this black apron on him, and him sitting at the machine and flying away, man, they're typing away. And then it always, the first rule was, he'd type, set you your name for your son. And he'd set up my name on this be metal bar, and you'd get that. And he'd hand it to you, and your hand would be, wee cub's hand would be so soft, you see. And the bar would only be lukewarm, but the magic had you, <laughs> you, were, you thought you were roasted, you know, and thought it could look immediately, and then they went to some of the boys down there. And all the men in that place, like after, uh, you could write a book about them. Tony's apprenticeship lasted five years in Montgomery's, but that's not where his father served his time. He started off as a message boy in the Tron Constitution about 19 and 10, and then after about two years or a year or so in that, the chance of a, of a apprenticeship came up and they knew that he was sort of okay uh, and I got a job as an apprentice so every seven years and then in, that was 1936 then he moved down to Montgomery's got a job in Montgomery's uh, and he was the boy should have bettered himself and the increase in wages was I think it was, t- it was 10 bob more he got a week to go down to it but 10 bob was 10 bob I mean it was important because they were the men who were only earning about three pound a week at that stage and uh, he was interviewed for the job down and Frank McNeil's. The father says, I wouldn't have heard it before, I wouldn't have going to be interviewed. Seeing Frank McNeil's. Ah, this is, got the job right away. Like. But that was, a, that was a setup in those days. Everything was informal and trust was, I think, was the whole thing. The trust in the new year. Tony's father was a printer all his lifetime. Did Tony ever imagine that he would do the same? Believe it or not, I stayed in Montgomery from 1942 to 1995. 53 years, the more I think about it. And when the first day I went down, I said to the man, Jimmy Baxter, long are you here, mister? Oh God, he says, I'm here now. And I started to count. Gee, I'm here 20 years. See me, mister? When I get my time served, I'm away, I'm away to Belfast. I heard about the, this college of technology in Belfast, because there was a printing school. Mad to get up to get at it. 55 years later, 53 years later, Joe Soap's still there. So, that was my <laughs> tip. Well, 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 tell us about the Montgomery's then, the Montgomery family. Well, the Montgomery family must have been a good family because they were all in the trade. Uh, there was a family of about 13 of them, I think. Now, they were unique in this respect that the girls, one of the girls was a typesetter, a mechanic on the liner type machine. She had served her time to the trade, but for a woman to be in the trade, was unheard of but as a sort of a family she just took her turn and done her work and was good apparently it was very good uh, they had a place in paris and they had a place in liverpool the place in paris they had to get out of it just prior to the war for safety sake and then they worked then in, in liverpool they kept it going for i think up to maybe after the war just you know uh, they used to do a lot of work for the uh, liverpool tram company because we used to see samples of the, t- the tram tickets excuse me coming over uh, one of them was a doctor, 
And the other sisters work in the shop up the town, uh, their own wee retail outlet in High Street. Uh, and one of the girls, one of the ladies, looked was uh, involved with the local Boy Scouts attached to Four Stone Presbyterian Church, you know, well, they, were, they were grand family and grand people to work for. I mean, the first day I went to work, I was very green, she says to me, uh, where do you hang your cap on a Sunday song? Ah, uh, where is she now? Oh, in the back door, Mrs. You know, ah, uh, she burst out laughing. Now and now, then told me far what she'd asked me. He, he says, he's got your son, boy, to become the Christian brother school and didn't know what kind of a question she was asking. <laughs> but, uh, and that family has died out now altogether. Died out, died out. Did they live in Oma? They were lived, they lived next door to the works. Oh, I well, that was the thing about it. You see, if you turn, in that respect, you were terribly well supervised. You could, you, you turn around there at your heel. You know, you couldn't afford back in the car because it just stepped through the door. And when I made the, my first, it was my first experience of what it was like to see the, how the other half of the world lived. Every Christmas, you'd be called on, you see, into the house, and there'd be this lovely wee, ca wee wooden casket in the middle of the floor, solid wee box, oh lovely about what, two foot by foot and a half, and you'd be told to bring in a screwdriver. In front of the screwdriver and you open the box, my first experience, I didn't know what was in the box, I thought it was tight, open the box, gently, gently open it very gently, right, get the lid off, and here would be these lovely bottles of wine, all laid out in straw, where they'd either been sent from Paris, to them, or whether I'd been sent from a London house to them, but every year this ritual, you know, first time I haven't seen bottles of wine, never been, never been drink it, <laughs> you know. But the, 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 they were an old family, and there must have been a very old family because reputedly she used to bring me in to show me this wee table, and I can't account for the authenticity of this, but I think it was true. She showed me this wee antique table, and she says, "Do you know, son, that they eat rats off that table and at the city dairy?" But there must have been a great family, but that the Presbyterian ethos, ethos of, uh, you know, work and get on with it. And there were great people to work for too. There were great people to work for. The family firm of Montgomery's changed hands and was subsequently bought by Noel Donaghy, a local businessman who also owned the county cinema. And Noel soon decided that printing was not in his blood. Noel stuck it for about two years. He was a cinema man and an accountant. I mean, well, printing wasn't in his blood at all. Stuck it for two years, uh, sold it, and that was how my father and Joe Hammond and Harry McCartney, who were workers in the place, came to be as p proprietors, simply buying their jobs to protect their, you know, keep themselves in a job. And they were men of, in their 50s, 55, when they took this on, like, you know. We used to be my father often said, remember him at the time, said to me, Tony is too late in life for me, but it might be some useful to you. It might be some use to you. Well, he had about 12, 14 years, like, uh, after that, you know. So, of course, uh, there's no way that he could have left the town or anything else at that stage. Like, it was too far on in life, and we were all sat in school, and just, uh, there were no other printers. All, all, all the houses were had a full coat of printers that they, were, they didn't need any. And at that time, too, remember that the army came down one day. We all thought we were for the street. Landed under the brass, measuring the place and looking at the thickness of the walls and chatting there. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And I go out and the boy with a chisel puts this big government property stamp on the bottom of the, 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 the old pillar into the works where it was going to be used when the invasion would come. Down the Dublin Road, we were going to head up the fold back the German troops at the gas works. You know, things like that, highly. And then, and all that, and then when the Yanks came, God, that was a good when the Yanks came. And the boy come round to get something printed, you see, and we were in the back of the This little leaflet, you see, for the American forces. Uh, here it was, uh, a leaflet uh, uh, advising the troops how to protect themselves from venereal disease or all these contagious diseases. <laughs> well, I remember when I came to reading the proof, my face was red, my dad's face was red, <laughs> and he was watching the copy, and I was the cop watching the... And on the same vein, another one that used to embarrass me when I had to read the proofs was from the Erin Hospital in Enniskillen. They used to come the, the uh, maternity, big maternity sheet down, a four-page record, as we should call it, of uh, the women as for, who were going on to have children. And there would be all these words on it, which I as a cub, like, my dad would even spell them out rather than say them. Like, you know, very bad words like breast or something. You know, when you think of the innocence of us,
Ah, innocent times they were indeed. But the printing trade, <laughs> like many others, had a bit of fun at the expense of the young trainee. There was great crack in the trade. You'd have been sent up to the con when you were an apprentice for a, with a handkerch. Take that handkerch on and go up to the con and ask uh, Herbie Livingston for a thin space. Well, a thin space was about the thickness of a, t a comb of a tooth. You know, your hair, your, the tooth, the comb you comb your hair with. One tooth of that there, that was the size of a hair space. Smaller than that. And you, you open up a time with a handkerch before you get this hair space. These are the tricks, you know. And then them laughing, you know, I'll tell you when we get the hell, you'll have to send you up the hell for that. And so you will up the hell, but they would send you somewhere else. Work was never turned away. The printer's day was varied. From whiskey labels to Bible tracts, books to carnival posters, Montgomery's catered for one and all. And thankfully, Tony Mathers had the foresight to keep copies of some of the thousands of items printed over the years, including a large selection of old calendars. Quotation calendars. I'm, I'm looking at a calendar here, 1942, Drumlega Presbyterian Church. Now, the quotations in that were, were they probably are more religiously orientated. Uh, well, they're not so bad, not, so, not really. He, he, he gets through too late who goes too fast. That was from a Mr. Crawford Oma. Uh, and then here's one from Mr. Mr. Williamson Long Day. From German guns and a woman's tongue, good Lord, deliver me. <laughs> but that, uh, that, that is the idea, that, that sort of thing we would be doing. These, these were done nearly, several of them have been done around the Christmas period of any year by the different churches or charitable organisations. The they, would, they would supply the quotations and to, to have a quotation put in, Mrs. Uh, the Reverend A.P. Chamberlain, M.A. Barnes scored uh, maybe half a crown or five bob for his quotation. So it'd be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven quotations per page. Uh, 50, so say two pounds fifty per page, or maybe make charge more. But then you have what have you got here? The whole year's a whole year's calendar. So there was half a pound for the church. Uh, well, most of us say are religious. Listen, well, listen, it's not the clothes that make a gentleman, John, but what? you have in you and what you have on there are, but that was one part of our, of our work another one here is some of the better ones uh, that's another quotation calendar from uh lower badoni with greening united parishes of lower badoni with greening gordon county her own upper badoni from bridge county her own uh, my mother said when she was young ladies were ladies then but now it takes her all her time to know them from the men that was uh mrs this is Dee McKimmon, Trina Madden, Gorton, 1950. Uh, I freely confess that the best of my fun I owe to the horse and the hound. Lieutenant Colonel G. G. Cox, Malamsbury, Wilts. So that they were able to collect the, these quotations from all over because they were friends of friends of the church. There's <laughs> the waterworks rules and regulations for the local waterworks. And there's a the schedule for the Oma Flower Show, Northern Ireland Chrysanthemum Society. And here's, there, there's now a, a business that's long gone. Fishing tackle and fly tying materials. White Brothers, Oma, Jim White. Now that, uh, that's history there. You know, spinning rods. And if my grandfather used to supply him with flies. My grandfather was a fly tire. And he supplied flies to that man. That business. And there's work from, we work coming from Belfast and everywhere around there's one from Woodfield Presbyterian Church, there's one for St Columbus Oma and uh, the cattle, there's one there that has, would be very, very, evoke many memories of Easter Monday horse racing at, at uh, Berra, Six Mile Cross. So 1954, all, right. all the horses and the, the riders. Oh, right. oh at, at least the Monday racing was very popular at that state that time. But uh, you could spend an hour reading these and laughing at them, but we haven't the time, is it? How long would that take to, to, to print well, from that the, would have been from, say, the minister comes in and says, we uh, like this print? Well, there would have been a good month's work on that, like, you know, a good month's slog. Was, was, yeah, well, that the linotype would have set it up, but I still had it put together by hand. And there were all those brasses, what we call brasses for rules, the borders cut and put on. They were slow, laborious jobs, the quotation calendars. You, you, you hoped they weren't coming about the place. Because they were slow work, but it was work, and I, you know, nobody ever was, was turned away put that way. I'm only just is, glad to get the work at the Is time. there a photograph there? Is there a picture yeah, there? There probably is. <coughs>
and there's an ad from Montgomery too. The ads sometimes make make more interesting reading. That's a photograph of Upper Badoni Parish Church, Plum Bridge. But then, how would you print that? In those days, you would have got the photograph and uh, the laborious. You sent the photograph off to Belfast, to maybe to the Belfast Telegraph. They made what was known as a stereo or a zinco, a block. In other words, that was a metal etched metal plate made by uh, etching out the, um, the metal plate with acid. Uh, the pl- the we thin pl- it was only really thin plate, not much thicker than, than a sheet of paper. Then it was nailed onto a, onto a wooden block around the edges here. You can't see it because it was counter sunk uh, to bring up the tape high, so that, that that was the same height as the tape, but well, a bit of an inch high roughly, you know, but the same height as so that the whole lot was uh, printed along with the tape. Uh, very few of the, nobody in the none of the local houses made their own blocks at that stage. They were all sent away. Uh, the Herald were the first to get on a sort of a scanograph, as they called it or something that time, to make the plates on the premises. But they were all Heath Robinson sort of things, you know, hit and miss. And that would be printed with black ink? Oh, just black ink. And it comes out then as tones of grey uh-huh. half, half tone, you would call it, half tone block. Highlights uh, and lowlights, and etc. Or just a half tone block. Is you were saying earlier on, you were very, you were ecumenical. Oh, I every every type of clergyman under the sun, we done the work from. That's a fact. Uh, and our and, and the same in all the offices, same in all the offices. In its heyday, the print union must have been the envy of many. Not only did it afford strong protection to its members, but it had an ethos of its own, with titles conferring status on each level of printer. The journeyman printer was a man who had served his time. And uh, I don't know why journeyman meant. I think that the hearing were originally that he was then pre- uh, capable of going on his journey, going off to be a printer and he move out then to anybody he wanted to go. But it was journeyman was the name of the man who served his time and was a qualified printer. The master printer was the man was the proprietor of a printing house. He was a proprietor. There would only be one master printer, and it came from. I think they had an association of the, the British Federation of Master Printers. But that just been the proprietor of a printing establishment. And then there was a journeyman and the apprentice. And at that stage, he served uh, a seven-year apprenticeship. Then uh, the union sort of got a cut down to six years. And if you were at school till you were sixteen, you, you got away with a five-year apprenticeship. And I was at school till I was sixteen, and I got away with a five. I think it was about the first to get away with a five-year apprenticeship in the town here. It was great, you know, it didn't seem like much, you know, but it was great to be finishing five years and earning it because, you know, you got a lock of bob, but you started with seven and six and then ten bob, it just went on gradually, but maybe in your last year, when you'd been doing a man's work, really, because you learned your craft, if you did learn your craft, uh, you would have been earning, but maybe only a bit of pound, 25 bob. And it was it was well structured when you went in first, depending on the house that you went into, and Montgomery's now they had a, Mechanical type setter, type setter. That is a, a, a liner type machine. It's a herald type liner type machines, a corner type liner type machines. But the rule was that you had to serve a year, or two years, two years as a hand compositor. That is assembling the type by hand, because they, they maintained that you learned your craft there, your spelling and your punctuation and all this sort of uh, idea. So then, when you have two years done. Everybody, every club of a service wanted to get on the liner type machine. But the only time you get on them, because <coughs> in Montgomery there's only one machine, the only time you could get on the machine was during your lunch hour. So you had to switch your lunch hour and get on the machine for half an hour, maybe an hour. Well, the first or second time that you got on it, with no one on it, your heart was in your mouth. Your heart was in your mouth. Because this wheels turning and everything going on and on. And one, one bad mistake like, could leave the damn thing down. From the day, and then and then it was supplied. It was hot metal supplied it, and the worst thing, the car, the most serious thing that happened to you, uh, and in my age, and it was a splash, as they called, which meant that the met, the hot metal got pumped out so hard that it flowed out over the the side of the pot, and then it congealed just within seconds. And then if your father come back, and he saw you trying to chip away this metal, you could expect a Lord's prayer. I can tell you. <laughs> But uh, that, that was the structure of an apprenticeship, hand setting first of all, and as well as that, there was these demarcation lines. F- curiously enough, you only could serve your time to be a compositor or a machine minder. 
And the machine mender was a man who actually, after he had made up the type, who then transferred that type onto paper via his printing presses. You couldn't go in there and do that. You could stand and watch him amazed at what he was doing. But once you set your course to be a compositor, to switch from being a compositor to a machine minder, there was no way you were going to get doing it. There was just no way. It was practically impossible. You could eventually, but there was that much hassle. You just, uh, you just stuck at the composing. It was uh, pr- protecting, the, protecting their jobs, just naturally enough. There again, the unions were, all the unions were based in England, and they were based in these big industrial areas where the big newspapers, the regional papers, and then the, the, the regional papers and the London papers. And the union was a, a very, very strong, very strong union. And in fact, so much so that other unions envied us. Not because we had any, we had no less hours, we had no more money, but we were so, what shall we say, disciplined, is the word. We were disciplined. You just could not move from one place to another without sending your card in and getting permission. And if there were so many employed in that place, and there, as well as that, another thing which I think they were envied us for was the control over the apprenticeships. It was probably immoral, when you think about it, but it was protectionist for jobs that uh, other trades when we had apprentices come in every bloody week, you know, bricklayers, carpenters, etc., etc., to no fault of their own, they weren't organised, with the result that the place was flooded with bricklayers or flooded with carpenters, hoping we found nobody, <laughs> uh, in a very short time, whereas the printing trade, you just, one man, pair, uh, journeyman. Now, that was uh, and a house, a small house, but say there were six journeymen, there had to be about six journeymen to get your second apprentice. So there was just thing, it wasn't one for one, uh, it was an ratio. Uh, you, had to have, you had to have a big staff before you had three or four apprentices, maybe one of the Belfast houses. But there was purely just a, 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 the head office was in England, and the, the as we call them, the, the, the chapels, which is the, the, the forerunner of the shops. The stewards of the shop, the shop, shop, shop steward, they were called chapels, were all big presses, big houses, big uh, national press printing works, the printing works. Uh, but then the father of chapel, as I said, was the shop steward, that was another great name for it. goes back to the time when the monasteries and the, uh, were the forerunners of the craft or the guardians of the craft, uh, before printing became at all. Uh, as we know now with the movable type, it was amongst just laboriously, you know, by, by uh, the gold coil. Uh, so that they kept they kept that association with the church, the monasteries, whether which is was nice. I always felt very comfortable with that. Mm-hmm. Father the chapel, sort of thing. You felt okay. It goes back a right, but so it did. It goes back to Wankin de Ward and and Caxton and fourteen eighty six and and Gutenberg and all the boys. Well, that's right, when you think of a great sense of history. Oh, aye, surely, surely. surely, surely. What were conditions like then when, when you started for, for young fellows, 16? You know, to me, they were quite good, they were good. What were the hours? You then? know, and the hours were half yet to six. It was a 48 hour week, as far as I remember. And you worked till uh, 11 o'clock on a Saturday. And you're off Saturday evening, and you're off Sunday, and you start again Monday morning. The first job you got when you went under the door was to light the fire, son, light the two fires and sweep the floor. When you had that done then, you were on the end of doing your bit of day's work. Uh, but as long as you kept the fire going, you were okay, because it was a cold big building, and you know you need the fire in the wintertime especially. There was no one of your asbestos or, or, or insulation or anything like that. There was just the ceiling and the slates, and that was it. The doors weren't all that good fitting. So it was cold, it was cold, well, okay. But uh, the people you worked with were, they were all gentlemen, like, you know, the, you know, well, we were fortunate that you were working with your father too. Uh, it was great, really, you know, because he made sure that you kept your nose to the drinkstone and that you learned the craft, you learned the trade, because he knew you were going to have to stand your own two feet eventually. The old ways and traditional methods have now gone for good. When did Tony Mathers become aware that the introduction of information technology would be so far reaching in the print trade? The day I, I compare the computer coming on as to, to the uh, Industrial Revolution in England, I always keep saying to the boys, like, there's no good this morning. It happened to the wooden industrial in England. It happened to the mining, this mechanisation. 
but that's what's really the, the really the end of the line. Now you have cutties and cubs. You do a couple of a year at the tech. Get a and and their printers because they're they have all the age and it helps that man can ask for it through the computers packages that are are, are, are programs for the computers that you know, can produce beautiful work. So that's that. One man and his trade. So until the next time, from me, Declan Ford, and producer Don McGorgan, don't forget, take a left at Market Street and head straight for Memory Lane.